Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Andrew, hello. We've be- we- we become stars of someone else's show, Sean Atwood. Yeah, we've had that quite, was quite a week. Fun. We have had quite a week. We were on Sean Atwood's show. We're like the first time we've been guests. Yep. Uh, yes, and it's a very nice plug for for the podcast. Some good questions. Yeah, uh, we're on for an hour and a half, which uh, I didn't think was expected. I don't know whether the other guests hadn't arrived, or uh, they had lots of questions. Um, some good. which we are not experts on, including UFOs. But um, we... <laughs> well, that was really if you if you've joined us from Sean's podcast, then welcome uh, to our wonderful world of scandal. Yes, it we was a, fun. A I did discover something about Andrew that I didn't know, which is that he's he's quite interested in UFOs. I am. Um, I have lots of little quirks. I think we should maybe think about doing a program on UFOs. Yeah. And well, I've been I've got an author who's a very senior lawyer who's got a lot of good stuff. So, and I, I was thinking of asking him. There's a lot of interest, and it's back in the news. It went out of the news, you know, when the internet came along, and there were no disclosures. Now that things are beginning to come out from government bodies, particularly in the states, uh, I think it's back on the agenda. Well, there you go. I mean, you said the other day that one of your clients for your literary agency found you by Googling sex maniac agent. So perhaps if you Googled little green men agent, we'd come to you as well. Yes, exactly. No, they do. <laughs> One of the other, sometimes I ask, why did you come? And they say I'm on the right tube line. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it's never it's never really for, for what I can do for them. It's for their convenience. Uh, so what else has happened? Well, we've had another sex scandal. We 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 did gay gay honey traps, didn't we, a few weeks ago with the John Vassell case? Yeah, and now we have a real on. live one in British politics. Just erupted. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the interesting things is William Ragg, who is the the MP who shared uh, private numbers with with uh, with the, in fact, the blackmailers. I mean, a very foolish thing to do. Um, is actually the chair of the committee that. Uh, um, basically interviews the civil service and holds them to account and deals with freedom of information. Um, yes, this is, if you don't know, this is a British MP who had to confess that he was, he's, not only was he sharing um, sort of nude photos of himself with, with a stranger, um, he was sort of blackmailed into sharing other phone numbers of people in British politics with this group. I mean, people are suggesting it might be Russian. Who knows? Uh, but there's some shadowy group that have been trying to kind of embarrass and entrap people in British politics by... Uh, Getting them to share naughty photographs. Yeah, I mean, there's a long history. I mean, there've been previous MPs who've resigned um, for for doing exactly the same thing. Not not um, with p- potential blackmailers, but just with 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 girls that they met. But I mean, there, there must be training for this. It seems extraordinary that that MPs can get caught in something as ele- elementary as that. It does seem weird. Well, maybe we should look at, look at that again when the story is clearer. Um, the other big thing we we want to announce today, um, before we get to the subject of this program, which we should have said, is Lady Colin Campbell. She's back and she has lots to say, but we'll get to her in a minute. We were talking about, uh, several people said to us, why don't you have a thank you button? To which we said, what's a thank you button? So we asked our producer, Theo, and he said, well, it's a way of people giving you tips, basically, like buy me a coffee, small amounts of money. If you're feeling um, in the mood and you want to help us, you like what we do, you want to support us in the future, there is now a button. I gather it's next to the download button on YouTube. And we might also be putting one on Apple as well when we work out how to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, we Andrew and I never really set out to do this podcast to make a ton of money. Uh, production values are low, our costs are low, but it's not free. And, you know, we're getting a little bit of income from the ads now. We're not quite covering our costs. I think we'd like to, wouldn't we? Really? Yes, I think it would be nice if we could cover our costs. Um, uh, I think it would be much easier to justify to, to my family, and particularly if we move back to twice a week. Yes, um, that's right. So that would be great, and also it's just a, it, it, it just it, it, for any feedback is always very helpful, um, and it's clearly something that lots of other people do. And we're learning, we're looking at other podcasts, learning from them, seeing what, how we can improve things. Um, be interesting to know if people quite like our very amateurish approach or they want something a bit more slick and professional. Uh, but I think we, we, we quite like people, the spontaneity. 
if we get enough people giving us a couple of dollars every now and again, we might be able to go back to the studio. Who knows? Yeah, so, exactly. And get better cameras and microphones. Yes, that would be For good. the moment, we're happy as you're as long as you're happy. That's good. Uh, and we're very happy to have Lady Colin Campbell back, third time. Um, and uh, I've been watching, I've read her book, and I've been watching some of the interviews that she's been giving uh, it just literally in the last day. Um, uh, so we're very much in the front of the queue for interviews. And she's raising some very interesting questions in those. I mean, was Thomas Markle invited to the wedding, for example? She's addressing the whole, all the stories about the surrogate pregnancy. Uh, and it's very interesting that the Sussexes have really said nothing about that. But there are these extraordinary pictures in Birkenhead, I don't know if you've seen them, of, of, of Meghan with the baby between her knees, uh, which is the most unusual pregnancy I've ever seen. Yeah. So, so there are I know, big questions. Look, Lady Colin Campbell, she's great fun and we love her and she's one of our favourite guests. Um, she doesn't divide opinion, but you have to respect her track record and her contacts. She genuinely is plugged in to yeah. people who most people can't speak to. And historically, she's got a really good history of saying things first. And things that start as gossip with someone like her can end up being the you know the content of serious award-winning biographies in the future. Yeah. So she's, well, we all, she's, she's, worth, she's we, always worth listening to. And her book, we, which I've also know. read, um, I mean, you know, there's much use of phrases like, I was told this by a royal cousin, or a high aristocrat of my acquaintance told me this, or a friend of the Queen said that. And you sort of think, well, do we believe it? I'm inclined to believe that she does have those contacts. Yes, I am. Um, well, remember that, that, you know, her first book on Diana w w came out. It was no one, just everyone just rather ignored it. And then Andrew Morton did his book. Uh, and he was basically saying exactly the same thing as she had said months beforehand. That's right. You know, that's he's, right. she's, I think she she is pretty well connected. Um, and there are some very interesting things. I mean, there's the, 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 the fact that Thomas Markle brought up Megan. And Doria wasn't really there. And why wasn't she there is one of the big mysteries which she addresses. Yeah, we will, I'm sure we'll talk book. to her about that. I found it really interesting. You know, we've talked to Valentine Lowe a lot. And Valentine was the first person who really brought out the stories of the alleged bullying carried out by Megan and this phrase, the Sussex Survivor Squad. Um, in this new edition of her book, she goes into that in much more detail. And it is very persuasive. You know, lots and lots of people who are just burned by working for Meghan. And these are not the men in grey suits, boring old farts with brigade of guards ties. These are young, committed, mostly women, a couple of gay men involved as well. It's, it's the new face of the monarchy, new kind of officials. Yep. And they really believed in the project, you know, the Harry and Meghan project. And one by one, they are reduced to, well, you know, tears, therapists. It's a very damning account. And she also is quite damning when she talks about the inconsistencies between, you know, the account that Harry and Meghan have given in Spare and the Netflix show and with Oprah. Yes. You know, everything they said about racism. It's, it's really hard to pin down what they really mean, even though it was obviously incredibly damaging to have that said she, about. Yeah, no, she's really holding them to account. I think it's pretty forensic. Uh, and I just know from my own experience with her that a lot of these things she wanted to write about in the previous version, and she didn't feel she could because of public opinion. And public opinion clearly has, has shifted a lot in the States uh, towards yes. them, uh, based on this evidence, which is, as you say, pretty compelling. No, look, I'm very persuaded about the, the certainly the, how very hard it was to work for her. I'm a bit less convinced by the baby stuff and the surrogate stuff. It seems very unlikely to me. And yes, okay, I'm not an obstetrician. Can bumps move around? I don't know. Um, the idea that she went to a sort of slightly unusual hospital to have the baby rather than the normal royal hospital. Maybe they just wanted to be private. You know, I'm, I'm inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt over that. And up and walking very quickly. I mean, it's an issue that, you know, there's a lot of stuff on social media. But, you know, why not damp down the speculation? I mean, th this is quite important because this is the child that's in the line of succession. Well, I guess they're obsessed uh, just, with their privacy, aren't they? I mean, it's a passionate cause for Harry, especially. Yeah. Um, and I know we are, but, by the way, for those who think we've become a full-on anti-Megan operation, we are very balanced and fair on this podcast. We're talking to it's um, our friend Clive Irving is coming back in a couple of weeks. And he's actually yeah. a big supporter of, of, of Harry, especially when it comes to his crusade against the tabloids and hacking. And I think yeah. he'll be giving us some good, very positive Harry and Meghan content. But... Um, 
I don't yes, think no, no, we do Colin try and will. present lots of different points of view, but Lady Colin has has a very strong point of view. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. Yes, I mean, have you? Ch- do you think you've changed your position since we started doing these podcasts on this issue? That is the biggest issue the royal family have faced and, until the, the recent illnesses, I guess, of the falling out with Harry and William and Meghan and Kate. Um, no, I don't think I have because, I mean, I wrote a previous book and I'm afraid I'm not in the Meghan camp at all. Uh, I feel, I think, increasingly sorry for Harry and I do think his campaign against the press it, it has some validity. I mean, you know, there was criminal activity going on here uh, and... Uh, with the hacking, and that, I think that is a step too far. So I, I think maybe yes, my views on Harry have, have become slightly mellowed, but not on her, I'm afraid. No, oh, no, you, th- you you do see the Wallace comparison, don't you? The Wallace Simpson comparison. Well, I mean, I think Wallace, in some ways, was much more of the victim than the perpetrator here, uh, and um, you know, she was manipulative, but she was less ambitious than. Uh, uh, I think Megan is. Um, you know, she 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 was trapped. The music stopped, and she was trapped with this man. Um, I didn't think she calculated in the same way that Megan did to to get her man and to. Uh, and you know, Wallace stayed with Edward to the end of his life. I, I, I don't think Megan's going to stay with with Harry for the rest of um, her life. Interesting. All right. Well, um, to all the new arrivals, if you're a Sean Atwood fan and you joined us, thank you. And everybody else, let's go and see what Lady Colin Campbell has to tell us, shall we? Absolutely. Let's do it. Here we go. Um, We'd like to have our old friend Lady Colin Campbell back with us for a third time. Welcome. She's new up de- for third time, isn't it? Yes. Fourth time. Three. 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 Third Three. time. Uh, and she's going. She's got a new book on Harry and Meghan coming up. Uh, I think literally this is one of the first interviews you're doing for it. And the first question is, why have you updated the book? Well, I've updated the book because the story has evolved since I wrote the book, which I wrote in 2019 into early 2020, and it was published in 2020. And so much has happened since then that it would have been awfully remiss of me to not update it. So I have updated it. And also, I have to say, a lot of the public was clamoring for me to update it. So I obliged. I'm an obliging yes. girl. <laughs> well, it's full of wonderful, wonderful new material. I mean, can you give us some idea of how you've updated it? What are the new the new revelations in it? Well, it took me 10 months, which I have to say was an ordeal, uh, because it's really difficult to update a book that already exists, and then you have to move it on in time, and so much has happened. Uh, it it really was a logistical nightmare, and it's much easier to write a book, you know, from scratch. And when I wrote the book originally, the um, the American publishers in particular said that because Megan was a woman of color, and I had been even handed about her. That I would be stoned on, and that my if I came to New York to promote the book, that there would be demonstrations outside of the hotel, blah blah blah. And so I decided to re- revisit and the book originally, and and the their instructions were to try to say everything positive that I possibly could which I did, and uh, I was, as a result of my instructions and their fear, uh, I was exceedingly generous to her, beyond that which she deserved. And I have simply stripped out all of that, because in the four years since the book was published, um, the Black Lives Matter movement has <clears throat> has um, peaked, shall we say. Megan's opportunism has become very apparent. And so I just stripped out anything that I felt was basically undeserved. 
And I've just also, the narrative has evolved in the four years where Harry and Meghan have stated that they are victims. And so the, the theme of the book is, are they victims or are they persecutors? And I think the book leaves you in no doubt as to what I think they are. <laughs> so you've written a book on narcissism. In particular? Sorry? Who have they persecuted in particular? Well, if you know the meaning of the word persecuted, they have gone after the British royal family, in particular the king and the princess of Wales. They have gone after the British people. Remember, we are all racists. You need to remember that it was a massive illusion that that wedding where there were hundreds of thousands of people supporting it and millions looking at tens of millions looking at it, that it was all an illusion. It, we imagined it. So, and they have, they have also, ironically enough, they have also been very unfair to the British mainstream media, the, the print publications in particular who have bent over backwards to not speak the truth about them, at least on the most important issues. You make the point that, I mean, she's only one-eighth woman of colour, and she never actually played the race card anywhere in her career until basically she could see the advantage after Black Lives Matter. Well, of course, she did play it before, slightly, because when she managed to get the Sunday Express to write about the fact that she was his girlfriend, thereby laying down her imprimatur and solidifying the relationship in a way that nothing else would have. She then freaked out because the British press alluded to the fact that she was a woman of colour. And if you saw her in the Netflix interview, she was outraged that the British press called her black because she said, in plain as day, nobody had ever called her black before. And this seemed to have been a cause of great offence to her. But she played the race card as and when it suited her to do so. And, but, and she started at the very beginning because he got Jason Knopf to issue that statement about the press were being misogynistic and racist. Nobody was being racist. Nobody said anything that was against her being a woman of color. And also, why would the press not comment on the fact that she was a woman? Is, her, is it misogynistic that the press says when they are reporting that a man is having an affair with a woman, that's misogynistic? Is he supposed to have an affair with only men? I mean, the whole thing, the, the cynical manipulation that she has involved him in and he has colluded with from the very outset is, quite frankly, in my opinion, disgraceful. Because I was just going to say, I mean, you wrote a book on narcissism. I mean, you, and I mean, one of the things you say in your book is that you think actually this could almost go back to the womb. You're very good on the childhood because you had good sources there, including her father, who I think is a friend of yours. Uh, and it c paints a completely different picture, for example, of Doria, who you say there is a Doria who was convicted of fraud, whether it's the same woman. Uh, but that Doria only met her drama teacher when uh, Megan graduated, that she really wasn't part of her life as a child. Well, our Gigi Perot, who is a great friend of one of my oldest friends, who, uh, her name is Elaine Trebek Carries. She was married to Alex Trebek, who in America, everybody will know who Alex Trebek is. He was a huge star. He he hosted Jeopardy for decades. And Gigi Perot was a child star. She's an old, old friend of Elaine. And Elaine is a friend of mine for over 50 years. So Elaine put us in touch with each other. And she told, and Gigi incidentally, was not only a child star, she was from a very old, good 
very rich American family. So you're not speaking about trash here. And Gigi told me that that she only ever met Meghan Markle's mother once, and it was at her graduation that she never, ever came to the school. She had no idea that Meghan Markle's mother was a woman of color, none. And Meghan, in my opinion, Meghan has, is very reminiscent of the movie Imitation of Life. I think she bent over backwards to not pass for a woman or a child of color. And she mixed exclusively with white families, etc. And she's never, to the best of anybody's knowledge, ever graced a man of color with a kiss, much less the, 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 her, her full gift. Let's put it that way. But I think you also make the point that, I mean, Doria uh, has been written into the script, but Doria had her own problems. I mean, you allude, for example, to white stuff. Oh, well, there's little doubt in the family's mind that Doria was busy pumping up Megan with all sorts of negativity and nastiness. And I, you see, being Jamaican, I have an insight into the gradations of color and the complexities of color that the average English or American white person wouldn't. Uh, uh, but I'm referring to drugs. Sorry? Oh, you're referring to, to drugs? Oh, sorry, yeah. I thought you were referring to color. No, because I was being very oh, discreet drugs. about I'm cocaine. Oh, J Doria was heavily into drugs. Heavily. And... Megan's tolerance of drugs, let's put it this way, was so acute that she, on at her first wedding in Jamaica, was perfectly happy to break Jamaica's laws and supply all of her guests, which was an offence punishable by many years in prison, incidentally, with drugs. So is it any surprise that she ends up with ayahuasca, ayahuasca, ayahuasca? Because she's ended up with Victoria, superb weed. <laughs> That's the the, the narrative has sort of been invented and it needs someone like you to correct it by talking to the people who really knew her uh, as she grew up and later on. Well, of course, she's. that's why she tried to, dis, to distance herself from and destroy the reputation of her family. And because, and she distanced herself, let's remember, from not only the white side of her family, but the black side of her family as well. Because Doria's relations were absolutely spitting mad and furious about the way they, they were erased out of her life. But yes, she she was quite determined that her version of events was going to prevail, notwithstanding the fact that it has absolutely no merit and bears no relationship to the facts. And so is, it, is, it your, is it your view then that she was really raised by her father and it was oh. only later that she decided, for whatever reason, to break with him and present her childhood in a way you think is inaccurate? She, as a little girl, she was in. She was raised by both her father and her mother for a t about a ten-year period. Her mother was missing in, missing out of action. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, and she was pretty much exclusively brought up by her father. This is a matter of record, you know, and there are various interpretations as to where Doria was. Her, her father is very loyal and refuses to confirm where Doria was. Well, why okay. would he refuse to confirm where Doria was if, it's, if there's nothing ominous? Let, well, you quote you quote that she she may be the Doria Ragland who was in for fraud. 
I have no idea. I have no idea. And obviously, for legal reasons, I have to make it clear that I am not accusing Doria Raglan, Megan's mother, of having been in prison for fraud or for anything else. But you do but, mention it. Well, I'm, I mentioned the fact that there are reports out there, documentary uh, evidence that sh that a certain woman bearing the same name was, you know, there, there, there's case number, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that could be an invention. That could but be no one's invention. been sued who said that, have they? No, no. But <clears throat> just because people aren't sued doesn't mean it's a fact, you know. Uh, we need to be clear about that. But whatever, wherever she was, she was missing in action for 10 years. And also, while she was involved in the earlier years with Megan's upbringing, and I know this from the family, she was also often missing in action. She was off with her druggy friends for days at a time, dumping the little girl on her father, who was working 75 hour a week. 75 hour a, a week. Uh, well, 90, 90 hours a week you talk about. Yeah. And and she also, so she was, and and Samantha and Thomas Jr. often had to babysit Megan while Doria was off. And Doria used to openly smoke and take drugs in front of Megan. And okay, well, if that's, I look, I've, I've no idea if that's true. It's probably... There's probably good reason to believe all this, but does this necessarily mean that we have to dismiss Megan's version of her childhood? Have you talked to Thomas about it? Does he think that she's sort of ra rode back on what really happened? Um, yes, I have spoken to Thomas Senior about it. What's he He's like? one of your main sources. What's he like in person? He's a very nice man. He's very decent. He there are certain things he just will not address. Uh, he has struggled to comprehend the enormity of what has happened to him because for 36 years he thought that he had a daughter who loved him and whom he loved. And she dumped him ignominiously overnight. And there, there is some doubt in his mind that she didn't set up the whole situation. He has also confirmed to me that he never received an invitation to the wedding. And when he queried this, because Doria had received one, she told him it had got lost in the post, most likely. So do, do you, because he's had his own struggles with drinking, hasn't he? He's, he's not been um, maybe the world's best father, but you think he was the biggest influence on her life? Well, I actually do not want to cast any stones in the direction of Thomas Markle. He was extremely hardworking. Mm -hmm. He was extremely responsible. He always saw that she was properly taken care of. Insofar as I'm aware, he did not have a problem with drinking. You can't have a problem with drinking when you are working 75 hours a week, being the lighting engineer on one of the top shows in the United States of America. Come on. Fair point. Where, where would, you know, you need to have your acute observatory powers. So, so that right shoots that down. You, you say and something very inter interesting funny. there. I mean, that he didn't receive an invitation to the wedding. This this is the first that this has been said, isn't it? I don't know if it's the first that's been said, but I'm saying it because he's told me. Yeah. And, and also, he has reeled from the shock, and I understand it. And I have, in my own limited way, tried to help him because I understood as a result of my grandmother's struggle to accept that my mother was a malignant narcissist and to and to just come to terms with the enormity of it all is awful if it is in your family and it's worse for a parent because parents are naturally disposed to not 
accepting certain facts about their children. But he has struggled to accept the enormity. And remember, Meghan has has not only discarded him in the most ignominious manner, but she has also tried to traduce his reputation in the most ignominious manner. And he and I both now accept that Meghan has had a few sleeves, few aces up her sleeve for when he's dead, where she could say, oh, I'm such a victim. Oh. But, you, I mean, she's a narcissist. Is Harry a narcissist or is he just totally under her thrall? Well, there, I think that Harry's problems go way beyond narcissism. I wouldn't have said that he displayed the characteristics of a classical narcissistic personality disorder person. Uh, I think he he has other issues, and he's certainly always been mentally fragile and emotionally inept as well as damaged. And there is, in my view, the possibility that he was born defective because Diana had severe bulimia when she was pregnant with him. That her bulimia was at its most severe when she was pregnant with him. And some studies suggest that this can affect the well-being of the fetus. Some studies. <coughs> Sorry. So. But I would not have said that Harry was a classical narcissist. I, of course, if you live, if 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 you live in a, in the gutter with a rabid dog with fleas, you're liable to get rabies as well as fleas. So you know that some of it will inevitably rub off, and we can see the evidence of some of it rubbing off. But I wouldn't have said that innately that his underlying personality disorder is anything narcissistic. I mean, one of the interesting things in the book is, is you talk about how actually both William and Harry were spoiled and that sort of Diana played up to this. I think you have a point where they say, do you know, behave badly, but just don't get caught. Mm -hmm. And you quote Kenneth Rose's diaries after he's been saying, staying with Pamela Hicks, um, because that's quite a different narrative again, that William wasn't the easiest child. No, William wasn't, but William has come right. Because also, let's remember, William was two years and three months older than Harry. Two years and two months, I think. Anyway, two or three months older than Harry, which makes a difference because their mother died when Harry was two weeks short of his 13th birthday. But William was already 15. And there are studies that have been done at the Maudsley which uh, one of which is a very famous study of uh, failure to grieve and melancholia. I think it was done in 1985 or 88, which shows that a child below the age of 14 who loses a parent fails to grieve properly, and this has a knock-on effect thereafter on its development. So we need to cut Harry some slack where that is concerned. But that's not a get-out-of-jail card, you know? So, so, but but William also uh, became a far more responsible individual. And, and Diana used to involve William more than Harry in her emotional dramas and scenes. So William, being that bit older and that bit more involved, will have quite naturally been predisposed, if he was going to become healthy, which he is, to, to resolve the conflicts and the issues that were presented by a very disturbed mother, while Harry has simply deified her. First of all, he erased her by his own admission, and now he deifies her. And she's, um, by her own account, she was never a saint or an angel. Have, have, you, found, any... have you found any more for this new version of the book about the dynamics of the four-way relationship between 
Harry, Meghan, Kate and William, because it's still to me a bit of a mystery why it, it ex imploded so quickly and so spectacularly. When you think they might have found a way to rub along with each other, they don't have to be living in each other's pockets. They could have lived even in different countries. But, and yet... Well, they... it's, it's, it very quickly became apparent, and anybody who's been in the situation where you have an, have an inappropriate interloper who is going to be spreading poison and causing trouble, uh, though, you know, very quickly, William and Catherine saw through Meghan and uh, Meghan's, Meghan's objective initially was to uh, love bomb them, bomb all them. Oh, look how strong. Let me hug you. And I'm so one. And, and you've been waiting your whole life to get my love. And of course, William and Catherine didn't go along with it because they saw right at the very outset how inappropriate that behavior was. I mean, and they pulled back and they welcomed her reservedly, but they welcomed her by Harry and Meghan's own account. They welcomed her. And but having welcomed her, they then, uh, but, but she, Meghan wanted to become besties with Catherine. And she wants, because her technique is going there, tell everybody how wonderful she is and how you've been waiting your whole life to get love from her. And then, before you know it, she's in the driver's seat and Catherine wasn't having any of that. And Meghan then got infuriated that she was being kept at arm's length because the one thing you can't do with a narcissist is thwart them when they are determined that they are going to conquer you. And it became very apparent that that Catherine and William were not going to be conquered, that Catherine was not going to become her bestie. And, and that triggered a great deal of rage in Meghan, which is what where the trouble began. Had Meghan given the the uh, relationship a chance to evolve naturally, they would have gradually become closer and closer. But Meghan went in gangbusters from the word go. Well, we were both strangers. We're, we're outsiders. We're going to be besties. And you're going to do what I say. And it didn't work because Catherine is made of sterner metal. Because there's always been concern, um, uh, even before they got married, about Meghan. I mean, they they came to terms with it. And you talk about the, the public reaction at the wedding. You begin the book. But, there, I mean, I found this even when I was doing my research, that there was concern that Meghan wouldn't be a suitable bride. It was all too quick, and she was a very different character to former royal brides. Well, let's remember as well, that the royal family has access to all sorts of information. And anybody who becomes close to a member of the royal family, whether it is a friend or a lover or whatever, is thoroughly researched. And of course, so there, there were no secrets where the royal family was concerned that Meghan had led an extremely interesting life. And that also, as the relationship hurtled along at great speed to matrimony, being pushed by Meghan, they, they understood that they were dealing with somebody who was avowedly wanting to integrate, but looked uh, by saying she, she was eager to become a part of the family, etc. But her track record and her present conduct was to the contrary. And the, the Queen and Prince Philip tried to stop the marriage. Well, Prince Philip tried to stop it, and the Queen was backing him up. That's new and to me. I've never heard that before. I've heard that William spoke to Harry and said, do you want to take this more slowly? I'd never heard that the Queen wanted it to stop. When Harry, when Harry went to ask his, grand, his grandmother and his grandfather was there, and this is what I was told, and I need to say that for me, that, that uh, he wanted to marry Meghan. 
his grandfather said to him, we do not marry actresses. We step out with them. And Harry went ballistic. And the queen intervened. And the queen told someone who told me that it was the very first time she had ever heard the expression because Harry said to her that they, they if, if, if they didn't, and I need to be careful how I put this because I'm slightly jigging it for legal reasons. Harry informed them that if they didn't agree to the marriage, they would be accused of racism. And also said to her that if they didn't, that she was just going to have to suck it up because he was going to marry her nevertheless. And the queen said to the friend of mine who said to me, because the queen said she'd never heard the expression before, but as soon as she heard it, she knew what it meant. And ironically enough, I'd never heard the expression before. And as soon as I heard it, I knew exactly what it Suck meant. Suck it up. This was the key turning point in the relationship, gosh. And so they accepted with reluctance, but they accepted Megan and to, to them, the only thing positive about Meghan was that she was a woman of colour. And had she not been a woman of colour, they would not have allowed the marriage. Not I mean, my memory is that in those early days, the fact that she was different, an actress from her background, and yes, her colour, all of that was seen as a hugely positive thing for the family, for the country, for the Commonwealth. There was loads of, you know, people have found the odd tiny reference in one newspaper article that seems a little bit sarcastic, maybe. But there was acres of positive coverage, which yes. I, this is why I've never understood quite how quickly it all unraveled. But obviously well, you're here to tell us because it's because Megan, she's a narcissist. It, Meg, it unraveled because Megan wanted it to unravel. Megan, Megan, it was in Megan's interest for it to unravel. It was in Megan's interest to be able to say, I'm not fitting in. They have rejected me. I need to move to California where I'm going to become the huge star I've always wanted to. She is I mean, a. And you think from the beginning that was her intention? Absolutely, without a doubt. Without I mean, she, had, she has a long tradition of falling out with close friends, falling out with family, of sort of isolating them and then moving on, and indeed doing the same to husbands and boyfriends, doesn't she? Well, that's her track record. That's her track record. I think, though, she's got herself in a vice of her own creation because it's not going to be that easy to move on from this situation because she has blotted her copy internationally. She has traduced herself in the act of traducing everybody else. She has shown herself to be a thoroughly undesirable woman that no man in his right mind would want to marry. And well, she's a lot sorry to drop it. Yep. So she can't George. move on. She can't move. She can't do a Jack. She can't do a Jackie Kennedy where Jackie was the most revered widow on earth and ended up on a billionaire's yacht. Megan can't do a Jackie because she is the most revered woman on earth, if not uh, you know, so she's the absolute opposite now in terms of reputation as to what Jackie was when she ran off with Ariel So She's a laughing stock in some respects, but I mean, she's now got, you know, she's now a brand influencer. She's going to make money. She clearly has supporters who are going to buy these goods. So she's not quite finished. She's popular oh, well. in America still, I think, isn't she? She's not popular in America. She's very, she's absolutely not popular in America. Uh, she'd like people to believe she's popular in America. And, you know, this... Uh, a, ro a Royal Oik website that she has come up with is, you know, I'm not sure you realise how extremely expensive it is to have... A web, not a website, to have the access to the goods. And if she, if she doesn't have tremendously rich backers, this is bound to fail. Also, 
Meghan is not somebody of any prestige or desirability. Most of her followers, such as exist, because there are all, an awful lot of revelations coming out at the moment that that her team, her Sussex squad, have used bots to pump up the, her supposed popularity. And indeed, on this website, I have received reports from members of the public who have complained to me about the fact that they or members of their family have found themselves listed as followers when they're not followers. So, so there's a tremendous amount of, of pumping up going on. But who's going to buy the goods? If, she, if she's not selling face creams at $5.99 that her followers can afford, does she really think that any, that any well-established star or any Greenwich, Connecticut matron is going to spend $495 for Meghan Markle's face cream. I mean, it, the whole thing's madness. And wait for it. It's going to be yet another failure. There are a lot of stories on social media about the fact that they may have used a surrogate for the children. Is, that, is there any truth in those allegations? Well, they certainly are worth examining, and her conduct is certainly worth examining. And a lot of these stories have not come out of nowhere. They are directly traceable back to Meghan's conduct. So, you know, if the stories, and, and, and the interesting thing about that aspect of it is, that it's all been done on the internet because the mainstream media have been so intimidated and so fearful of falling foul of Harry and Meghan and doubtless the royal family and also being caught up in any litigation that they have avoided the subject like the plague. They have avoided the subject when it has been in their, it's been a part of their duty to have reported upon the subject, but they have ignored it totally. And I would be surprised if they do not continue to ignore it until such point as it becomes untenable for them to ignore it, at which point they will ought jump on the bandwagon, as we have just seen what they did with Catherine and and her illness. What's the evidence for a surrogate baby? I'm not going to answer that question in this on this forum. If people want to see the subject properly addressed, they need to buy my book. Right. OK. Well, well, we will be recommending your book at the end. On another thing, I mean, talking about litigation, do you think Harry will win his cases for press intrusion? Uh, I mean, do you think that is a very justified fight that he's got? I think it's an outrageous abuse. I don't think it's a justified fight. And I think if Mr Justice Fancourt allows him to open up things, this it will be absolutely antithetical to the interests of freedom of speech, civil liberties, and the justice system. Uh, unfortunately, Keir Starmer, if he gets in, is interested in reopening the whole business of and and revisiting and the and doing the second tranche of the Leveson inquiry, which was shut down, at which point, yes, Harry might end up being covered in glory uh, for the tremendous accomplishment of depriving the citizens of this country of the right to free speech and the press of the right to having made tremendous errors to continue without being bankrupted. Oh, this is going to be a great accomplishment. 
but isn't right this something? but isn't this about hacking? Isn't yeah, this about listening to his phone? But that a uh, story. That has been done and dusted. That Carrie's trying to open up matters going back to 1994. You know, nobody's justifying what the press did. And I certainly wouldn't be justifying what the press did. I am one of the few people in this country who has successfully sued and had to sue every single five of the law of the main newspaper companies in this country. So if I'm here in that position, telling you that this is an outrage. I think you can bank on the fact that it is an outrage. I have no brief for the press abusing anybody. But the fact of the matter is we as a democratic country need a free press. Without a free press, the politicians have the right to run riot. Not only celebrities and royals, the politicians. The reason why public figures like me and Harry and the King and William have to put up with the inconvenience of a rabid press is for the civil liberties of the ordinary people and to make sure that they are policed by, that the politicians are policed by the press. If you shut down the press, Who's going to police them? What have, you know, let's look back at what happened in Nazi Germany, in Stalinist Soviet Union, in the German Democratic Republic, etc., etc. Haven't we had enough evidence in our lifetime as to the fact that we need a free press and that pandering to privileged princes is not the way to protect the interests of the people of this country? That's the whole outrage. No, that's a good beat speech. That's exactly that's what the speech. podcast is about. What does the future hold now for the couple, do you think? Ever and what would you advise them to do? I think ever-increasing failure and marginal, marginalisation. I think they have exposed themselves as chancrous creatures that nobody wants in their right mind to be a part of. And I think that this is a direct result of their own treachery to their families, their their absolute lack of regard for the privacy of anybody else as they demand not only privacy for themselves, but they demand the right to get away with any abuse that they have committed. So you don't think a reconciliation either with King Charles or with William? Well... You know, Charles, being a parent, and I get this, and I mean, I get it in terms of Thomas Markle as well. A parent will always want, wherever possible, to reconcile with a child. I understand the dilemma. I understood it. I wrote about it in terms of my mother and my grandmother. I see it in terms of Charles. I see it in terms of Thomas Markle. William. Horse of a different colour. What a parent will accept and bend over backwards to justify, a sibling will not. And my understanding is that William will never forgive Harry. Never. He knows what he's dealing with. And as long as Harry is with Meghan, there is no way back into the family as long as William is a part of it. And Catherine also, my understanding is, is very firm about the fact that she does not want that malignant couple, and certainly not that malignant sister-in-law, near her or her children. Why do you think they lost Frogmore Cottage? Because of its proximity to Adelaide Cottage. The the then Cambridges did not want the Sussexes to have to, to be near neighbors. You know, when I was writing, uh, no, before I wrote the updates on this book, I was contacted by somebody from Givenchy about what had happened at that fitting between Meghan and Charlotte, Catherine and William will never forgive Meghan because no matter what you do to me, 
and I forgive you. But if you do it to my child, I will never forgive you. They know what they're dealing with, and there is no way back for them. Of course, if it became a matter of for the protection for the interests of the monarchy somehow that Harry should be reincorporated in a measured way, it won't be to any large extent. You see, people seem to understand. Don't understand. There's a huge difference between what's happened with Prince Andrew and what's happened with Harry. Prince Andrew has never betrayed his family. Prince Andrew has actually sacrificed aspects of his self-interest for his family. Harry has betrayed his family. You do not embrace a traitor if unless you possibly as a parent you think, oh well. You know, he was he was possibly born defective. He has all sorts of personality and emotional and drug problems. Oh, I'm going to, you know, he's my child. God gave him to me. I need to to keep my end of that spiritual contract. I mean, that's the thinking that goes into people who believe in God and have children. And so they never want to absolutely sever the tie. A sibling, totally different. Is the relationship between Harry and Meghan likely to um, be permanent, or is there a chance that might break up? And another question, I mean, if Harry had married Cressa de Bonas, would we be talking about a completely different scenario? We certainly would be. To totally different. I mean, Cressa Bonas's mother nearly married my stepbrother-in-law. <laughs> you know, so... She nearly was my stepsister-in-law. <laughs> Lucky uh, escape. So, well, no, no, no. Um, it, it, it was a lucky escape, actually. You know, they, but she, had he, had he married someone like Cressida Bonas or any other nice girl, none of this would be happening. All of this is happening because to fulfill Megan's ambition, so, and they are multifaceted, and they are all totally selfish, and ultimately they're proving to be self-destructive. And will she tire of him? Will she want to move on to someone else? Well, my observation of personality types like that is that they simply use people. And as long as the person is, remains of use to them, they will maintain the basic structure. I mean, my parents remained married for the whole of my father's life because it was in my mother's worldly interest to remain married to him. You know, there's no reason why a narcissist won't, won't remain married forever. That doesn't mean they're going to give the, the victim of their matrimonial uh, involvement an easy ride. You know, it's one day love bombing, the next abuse or misuse. And so I make no predictions. I think if if Meghan, I, I don't see Harry having the strength of character to actually separate from Meghan. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think he has it within him. Have attempts been made by the family to try and encourage him to uh, perhaps break up the relationship to come home. I mean, even though the children are in California. I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and also, we can bring this to a halt sooner rather than. Yes, later. that's a good place to end. Well, thank you so much for talking well, well, to I, us. I, I, mean, I just want to point out we've got 40 minutes into an interview and you've not called either of us a naughty boy yet. And we're quite disappointed. Oh, <laughs> you. Naughty boy. <laughs> she does it behind the scenes. <laughs> You'll get another mug for that. Oh, very entertaining very and interesting. Fun. And I think it's anybody who uh, has had any interest in this subject will want to read your latest. Um, yeah, no, it's a great latest read. material in the new ver version of the book. You know, very well sourced, very, very interesting. And I've read the previous version, and there's a lot of new material here. Oh. So this is better than the other, isn't it, really? Well, you'd be allowed to be more honest. And, and I think before you had to pull your punches a bit because of American publishers, whereas now I think the world has caught up with you. 
Thank you, darling. And the, yes, it's so nice to not have to wear gloves. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to be said, the world caught up with you on Diana because you were one of the first people to write about I that. The first. I wasn't one of the first. I was the first with Diana and I was the first with Meghan and Harry. You're a then, prophet in your own country. <laughs> well, let's not get carried away. And, <laughs> uh, uh, I simply am fortunate to have access to information that others then have to catch up with. You know, well, they can catch up on it from the podcast. So we're Thank very you grateful very to you for talking to us. Yeah, thanks uh, a lot. And See we you wish soon. you all the best with the book. Okay, bye. Suck it up. Suck it up, yes. Grandma. Yes, that's so. I mean, a lot of very interesting stuff there, uh, which I hadn't really noticed even reading the book. So um, that's a very interesting question, you know, about. Um, the, the, the concerns about the marriage. I remember when I was researching about Batten in, in, in 2018 19, the concerns among the royal household about her. Um, so, it's interesting, um, isn't it? I mean, a lot of the criticism will come down to sourcing. And I've, we've all written royal biographies. I've written mine about Diana. And I've used phrases like, you know, highly placed courtiers, um, friends of the royal family, people who are in the room. Because you can't name people, they won't be named. Um, or we got to them because I think we, the company I worked for had a very high reputation. And I did sit and talk to these people. I, I know the sources I reported were telling me things. And, and you know, that's what that's largely how uh, Lady Colin Campbell operates. I don't know. I mean, is it a friend of the Queen told her this? Or is it a friend of the Queen told a friend told a friend told her this? I don't know. But it does well, have I mean, a ring of truth, I think, especially in terms of that conversation. Between Harry and his grandparents, I I could quite see him losing his temper like that, can't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I could see, you know, the the feeling that you know she might not be suitable. Um, uh, and you know, it'll be interesting to see what the reviews say, and 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 again, what comments on social media. But um, I, I'm a great fan of of, of Lady Colin. I, I I think she she goes where a lot of royal biographers don't go. Yeah, we talked I a lot. I mean, we've talked about Meghan a lot, obviously, with her. Um, Harry's psychology is so interesting, isn't it? He's, maybe he chose Meghan partly because he thought she might blow the whole thing up. You know, he himself was looking for a reason to to kind of break away and make a great gesture. You know, but the, you hear that the relationship with William wasn't that great even before Meghan came along. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think there's an argument in that, and that's clearly what happened with with Edward VIII and Wallace. Um, but I think he was also, you know, a very uh, easy vessel for her to take over um, because he was damaged, and not very bright and perhaps felt a bit isolated and was looking for some sort of purpose. Uh, and he's sort of been dragged along with her. The question is, you know, will he reassert himself or will he become her poodle? Well, that's quite an episode. I'm sure people will have lots and lots to say. People have been commenting more and more on the shows. Actually, did you notice that John Harris, uh, expert on Rudolf Hess, He's been coming into the comments on that program and responding to people, you know, taking a lot of time to respond quite carefully to the pe things people have said. Um, and consequently, that show's gained about another 500 views, I think. People really like that engagement. So yes. we'll be, we will be active in the comments on this program. I'm yes. not quite sure we can promise if Lady Colin Campbell will, but we will be. We will try, to, yes. We'd love to, know what you, love to know what you say. And um, don't forget, three little dots. Click on them, and apparently you can give us a couple of dollars if you want to. No pressure. Yep. And subscribe. And tell your friends. You know, we'd like to continue. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it's getting to a crunch point where we need to see if we can justify the costs of doing this. Yes, especially to our other halves. <laughs> and our publishers. All right. Well, I think we're done. I'm not entirely sure what's, what we've got next Sunday. We have a couple of choices, don't we? We have two. We have Simon Viger, the the Channel Five Royal Correspondent. We have Clive Irving, as you've mentioned. We have Hannah Barnes, uh, and we also have the Roman Roman scandals. Oh yes, the Roman the scandals. That's that could be very different and fun. Um, anyway, we'll see what we've got in the bank, and, we'll and of course, it. and and possibly a program on Putin with Peter Pomeretsev. Yes, well, yes, that's my old mate Peter Pomeretsev has become an incredibly important global analyst of what's happening in Russia is going to talk to us about Putin and how Putin managed to kind of interfere with European politics 
in the years up to the Ukrainian war, which is uh, a scandal that isn't much discussed, but uh, was very, very important, I think. So, yeah, lots of scandal-rich goodies to come. Thank you for being with us today, and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 